Yeah, and we hope that you guys have a great time as we head out and be a part of all of that is going on. Such joy, isn't it, hearing him? I hope that we get to hear some woos and stuff like that during the sermon today. It'll be... All right. Sin, it's an uncomfortable word, isn't it? Sin, the first time we hear it, it often makes us squirm. It catches us off guard. It it isn't a word that we hear used too much in the average church today, yet it's only within churches that we hear the word used. Sin comes from the Latin word which means guilt or guilty ones. Sin. Yet as we read through the book of Ezekiel as we're doing at the moment, we cannot escape this concept of sin. It goes on, the section we'll come to here, chapter after chapter after chapter, talking about sin and judgment. Andrew, over the last two weeks, has led us through Ezekiel chapter 1 and chapter 2, where we begin with this vision of who God is. And then the call of Ezekiel to reach out to the people who are in exile. His message was simple. Israel has broken the covenant with God. And he's warning them unless they turn back towards God, they're facing imminent destruction. They've broken his covenant. They have sinned. By turning towards other gods and living their lives in such a way that is practicing injustices to the people of their nation and the nations around them. And Andrew, as I said, preached chapter 1 and chapter 2, and then he's given me 30 chapters of sin and judgment to share on today. And basically what what I'd hope to do in our time together is actually just share some principles that we can use as we read through the book of Ezekiel to how do we understand these chapters? How do we approach them? What do they say? This first section, which will draw most of the passages out today, runs from chapter 3 to 11, And it's kind of an overview of of what God's thinking here. And then from chapters 12 to 24, we see specific judgments spoken against Israel. From chapter 25 to 32, we read about specific judgments against the nations who are around Israel. And finally, in chapter 33, we see judgments spoken against Jerusalem itself. And over these 30 chapters, we see this topic of sin and judgment that it's something serious. See, in these chapters, we see the use of sin, iniquity, transgressions used over 40 times. When a, when a land sins against me by acting faithlessly, I stretch out my hand against it and break its supply of bread. I send famine upon it and cut it off, man and beast. If you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall surely die for his iniquity. Surely transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we rot away because of them. Forty times there's verses like this. Wickedness is spoken about 40 times. And I'll give it, to, uh, and I'll give it into the hand of foreigners for prey and the wicked of the earth for spoil. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his ways and live? Over 40 times it refers to wickedness. God's anger and his wrath is referred to almost 40 times in these 30 chapters. Thus shall my anger spend itself and I'll vent my fury upon them and satisfy myself and they shall know that I am the Lord. Therefore I will act in wrath and my eye will not spare nor will I have pity and though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them almost 40 times. Talks about God's judgment and punishment almost 30 times. I will judge you according to your ways and punish you for your abominations. Profane wicked one, prince of Israel, whose days have come, the time of your final punishment almost 30 times. There's these, this repetition that goes through. And to be honest, as we read through these chapters, it leads us to ask the question, why is sin such an issue? 
Like, why does God make such a big deal out of this? That he's saying it so many times and so aggressively. Well, just like in week one of the series, to understand this, we need to have a vision of who our God is. To understand why sin is an issue, we need to understand the very nature of who our God is. And we often talk about it, the fact that our God is a God of love and of forgiveness, which he is. We talk about him being the creator and the one who sustains and holds everything together, which he is. We talk about him ruling and being on the throne and that all nations will come before him and bow down and worship him, which they will. Here's these things. But there are some aspects of God that we don't like to talk about as much. We don't focus on them. And I think the reason for that is it makes us too uncomfortable. It challenges us too much. And we need to see these things to understand why sin is such an issue. Why there's 30 chapters of speaking about sin and judgment. So I'd like to just share a couple of aspects of who God is, a couple of his characteristics this morning, so we can get this idea of who our God is. The first one I think we need to understand is the holiness of God. God's holiness is a characteristic that is the very center of his being. It refers to God's absolute moral purity. That is, our God is not only perfect in his goodness, He is the source and the standard of everything that is good, of all goodness. He is absolutely and in every way perfect. He's never sinned. He's never sinned. He's absolute perfect light in which there is no darkness at all. Our God is holy. And Isaiah has a vision of who God is. We can read about it in Isaiah chapter 6. And it starts to share some of this this imagery of this. Because in the year that the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on his throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim, the angels, and each had six wings. With two they covered their face, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And they called to each other, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations, the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Our God is holy. And this is the only attribute as we read through scripture that is ever raised to this third repetition. Holy, holy, holy. It's like saying the equivalent that he is really, really, really holy. God is holy. And because of God's holiness, because of his purity, because of the very nature and core of who he is, sin can't stand in his presence. It has no place. And God doesn't have place amongst sin. It's separate. He's completely pure. And because of this, because of this nature that he has of holiness... It's why we read the tragedy that we see in Ezekiel 11 where God's glory raises up. The same vision that Ezekiel had in chapter 1, that same vision of who God is, the glory, raises up from the temple. He does this because of the idolatry and the sins of God's people. He raises up and he leaves the temple and starts heading east. He's going, I can't be here. What you're doing is rising a challenge against my holiness. I can't be here. You're pushing me out. We need to understand that, firstly, our God is holy. He's totally pure, and sin can't stand in his presence. And for us as his followers, if we get a glimpse of the holiness of God and then try to remain indifferent to sin, it's impossible. If we see God as being holy, and that's the one that we worship and drawn to, it challenges us to live our lives differently in response to him. We need to understand God's holiness. Secondly, we need to understand God's justice. We have a vision of who God is, a God that is just. 
And again, like his holiness, God's justice isn't an optional product of God's will, but rather a foundational and unchangeable principle of his character. Our God is just. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. See, God's justice is rooted in God's character and in his creation. He is the rock. His works are perfect. All his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong. He is upright and just. The Lord is righteous. He loves justice. The maker of heaven and earth upholds the cause of the oppressed and loves righteousness. The Lord Almighty will be exalted by his justice. Because our God is just, this means he cannot let the impacts and the effects of sin go undealt with. He cannot remain just and simply accept all the injustices that happen in our world. He can't remain just and do nothing about it. So simply put, he cannot remain eternally righteous and sit by without addressing every sin that stands up against his rule and still remain just. See, for God, pacifism isn't an option when it comes to this. God's justice is a serious thing. He takes justice seriously. Which is why when we're reading through this section, we we come up to verses like in Ezekiel 3, where God's calling Ezekiel and he says, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give a warning for me. If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way, in order that he'll save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity, but his blood will be on your hand. But if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die for his iniquity and you have saved your soul. Again, if a righteous person turns from his righteousness and commits an injustice, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because you have not warned him, and he shall die for his sins, and his righteous deeds that he's done shall not be remembered, but his blood will be at your hand. But if you warn a righteous person not to sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live, because he took the warning, and, delivered, and you have delivered his soul. See, God is just, and he takes sin seriously. And because God is just, it demands that he cannot be okay with sin existing. His holiness says he cannot exist in the presence of sin, and his justice means he cannot permit sin to continue in his creation. But the problem is, I think where we run into issues with this, is we go, I don't take sin seriously. I don't think it's an issue. Like, okay, we accept that there are big sins, right? I'm sure we're, we're all okay with that. We're, and when the sins agree with the way that we feel. Like things like if someone murders someone, we're like, oh, that, yeah, that's an issue. Yeah, well, that's clearly a sin. That's wrong. Yet we treat something like a white lie like it's nothing. Because our view of God is too small. It's like, oh, it's just this little lie. It's no real issue. It's not a big deal. Or like, I know it's wrong to steal. Like, stealing's bad if it's anything that's really valuable or important. But I can take something small or I can twist something for my own gain. Because what we do is we replace this idea of righteousness with self-righteousness. If I'm okay with it, then it's okay. Because God will hate the things that I hate and pardon the things that I'm okay with. See, our view of God is simply too small, isn't it? Sin to God, when we understand his holiness and his justice, he sees it as a real issue. Sin is an issue. And it's easy to be sitting here, sitting today and going, yeah, I get it. I get it. Sin is an issue. Sin is an issue. And it's okay because I'm someone who follows God. I know God. This is all good. Like, 
I'm one of the good guys. I believe in God. I go to church. I pray. I read my Bible. I pay my taxes. I'm one of the good guys. Sin is ripe. All I need to do is look out my window and I can see it everywhere. I see it on the news. I see it on bus advertising. I go to shopping centers and it's like a sea of debauchery out there. Like there's there's sin everywhere. But it's okay because I'm one of the good guys. And we see that. We can see that in our world. And we carry that mentality and it's easy to go to the passages that we read through these chapters and read them like this. It says, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak my words to them. For you're not sent to a people of foreign speech or a hard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many people of foreign speech and hard language whose words you can't understand. Surely if I sent you to such, they would listen to you. But the house of Israel is not willing to listen to you, for they're not willing to listen to me. Because all the house of Israel have a hard forehead and a stubborn heart. And we read these passages where it's talking about the house of Israel that God's talking about, and we're like, that's talking about the nation of Israel, right? Like he's talking about Israel, so that, that's a nation. Uh, and inside of Israel, there are those who follow God. And then there's the people who are living around them. The people who have like a nominal faith or they don't know God, just like what it's like in Australia. Well, it's like with us. We're, we're the people who follow God. And he's talking about the nation, like the nation of Australia. And there's sin is ripe and people have a stubborn heart, hard forehead. Because our world hates God, but we're the faithful believers. We're the ones who are good. They're the ones who sin and are bad. God will judge them and love us. And we can easily give ourselves a pat on the back and go, we are the ones who are in the clear. However, you see, Israel, it wasn't a democracy like in Australia. It wasn't a nation that built laws based on what we want to vote in and what us as a nation is like. See, it's not like Australia because Israel was rather a theocracy, not a democracy. And what a theocracy means is that they're people who live under God's rule and reign. It's better to be understood as that seeing them as the chosen people who live under God's rule, God's reign, and God's ways. They're essentially his people, his representatives, called to be a light to the nations around them. If I said today, who are the people who live under God's rule, God's reign, God's ways? Who are the people that are called to be his representatives, called to be a light to the nation? Who's that? It would almost be better to think of that as talking about the church today, wouldn't it? Like we're the ones that are called to live that way. And this warning that's being delivered is being delivered to those people. It's being delivered to us sitting here today. So when God says something like, this is Jerusalem, this is my city, I've set her in the center of the nations and the countries are all around her and she has rebelled against my rules by doing wickedness more than the nations and against my statutes more than the countries around her, more than those who don't know me. For they have rejected my rules and have not walked in my statutes. Therefore, thus says the Lord, because you are more turbulent than the nations that are all around you and have not walked in my statutes or obeyed my rules and have not acted according to my rules, all the rules of the nations that are around you, therefore the Lord says, behold, I, even I, am against you. I will execute judgments. I will execute judgments in your midst and in the sight of the nations. Or another way we can read something like this, from a different source, a different era, goes like this. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart will produce good fruit. And the evil person out of the treasure of his heart produces evil. See, sin is a real thing. We can see its presence in the fruit in our lives. 
Just because I've decided to follow Jesus, just because I go to church and pray and do it, doesn't exclude me from falling back into sin. It doesn't. And I hate to break it to everyone today, but we're by nature a sinful people. We live in a sinful, broken world. And we constantly are selling ourselves for less than what we were created for. And we walk out of step with God. We break a relationship with him. We push him out of our lives. And this invitation and this warning from Ezekiel to us is to take sin seriously. Take it seriously, to examine our lives, to see where is sin in it. Where am I out of step with God? Where am I pushing him out of my life? You see, we don't sin because we're not sure that it's wrong, but despite knowing it's wrong. Sin is an act of rebellion against God. The heart of sin is this raging battle. Is it going to be my will or God's will? Which one am I going to follow? See, for me, for as long as I can remember, I've loved eating chips. Like a packet of chips, if it's there, I'd love eating it. Uh, I eat chips when I'm sad. I eat chips when I'm bored. I eat chips when God feels far away. I eat chips when I'm tired of doing the right thing. And sometimes, to be honest, I just eat chips because I want to. Every time I eat chips, I feel bad about it. Yet the promise of chips... The promise it makes, it's deafening. It says, we'll make you happy. We'll satisfy you. And like Pringles, once you pop, you can't stop, and one is never enough, right? So I lie to myself. I say, God won't care if I eat a chip. No one will even know if I eat a chip. I can just stop eating chips tomorrow. I mean, wait, some people don't even think eating chips is wrong or it's a sin because everyone gets hungry. It's a normal thing to do to eat chips. And sadly, the moment I give in and eat chips, I remember that I hate chips. They make me feel sick. I feel ashamed. I feel weak. They never bring the joy they promise. So what do we do? What do I do? I run to God. I confess my sin to him. I tell him, I'm sorry, I hate chips. I'm never going to eat one again. I, I go to my house. I throw away all the chips. I want it to be true. It is true. So I'm at the shopping center. I'm walking down the aisle and I see a bag of chips. And I remember I love chips. I've had such a bad week. It's been hard. I deserve a chip. It won't be an issue this time. See, sin blinds us to the truth while promising to satisfy us. Sin always ravages your soul whilst promising to remove its pain. It always promises what it cannot provide and delivers what we do not desire. We're to examine our lives. The warning of Ezekiel Examine, where is sin in your presence? Where are you pushing God out? And there are a couple of signs that I'd like to share this morning that might show that in our life today that we've begun to push God out, that we're beginning to walk out of step with him as a church and as individuals. And the first one I want to share is the fruit of seeing pride and self-righteousness in our midst. That is thinking that I am better than someone else. I am better than them. Like, I'm the good Christian. I'm the good follower, and I've got no sin in my life. And whether that person's outside the church or the person sitting next to me, I think I'm better than them. They're the ones who have got the issue. Yes, God talks about sin, but that's for other people. That's not for me. I pump myself up. The other way that we think about this is to go, it's your job to serve me, not my job to serve you. I'm the one that deserves this. And as a church, we want the people around us to serve us, not us to serve them. And as a church together, we want to serve ourselves as a community and not serve the world around us. And if we see the, that fruit in our lives, we're starting to walk down the path of pride and self-righteousness and pushing God out. The second fruit that we can see is if we fall into the fruit of gossiping or complaining. 
See, this is often rife through churches. We do it when we're upset or frustrated. I just need to go talk to Margaret about this. Like, she would understand what's going on. Like, this is just so annoying, and I'm just getting comfort. We do it through our prayer chains. Oh, I'm just got to tell Bobby so we can be praying for this person. You never know what's going on for this person. We, we want to go and pray for them. But not just because we want to lift them up. We want to talk or complain. We do it when we want to complain about things that are happening, when we're frustrated and we speak aggressively to each other or go and bicker and complain to others in our circle about something rather than wanting to spur each other onto good works and love the fruit of gossiping and complaining. And we do that and we push God out. The other main one that can happen, the other fruit that we can see, is that when we begin to have contempt for those who don't know God. Similar to having pride and gossip, that's when we sit in our midst, where we come together into our huddle and we want to have strong judgments against those who don't know God instead of mercy and compassion towards We want to fight them. We want to judge them. We want to attack them and condemn them. Instead of seeing them as broken people who don't know and can't see the truth of who God is, who know the love of God. We want to elevate ourselves up like we've got the moral high ground, that we're the ones who are clear of sin. We do no wrong and all those guys do wrong. And we become like the man in the temple who wants to stand there and pray and say, God, I'm so happy you didn't make me like that sinner instead of having mercy and compassion. Sin is a real issue. It can creep into our midst and we try to push God out. And again, if a righteous person turns from his righteousness and commits injustice and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die because you have not warned him. He shall die for his sin and his righteous deeds that he has done won't be remembered, but his blood I require at your hand. But if you warn a righteous person not to sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live, because he took the warning, and you will have delivered his soul. Through these chapters in Ezekiel, I believe there's a warning for us. It's our warning. Sin promises you in a moment to give you the pleasures of a world, full of, to give you pleasures in a world full of pain. That's what it promises. It promises to satisfy your anger from the moment, to soothe your ache for a second, to relieve your anxieties by distracting you from distracting us from what's going on presently around us and amongst us. We sin because we don't like the life we have and are too afraid to admit it or to go to God with it. Sometimes we sin because we're angry at God. We're frustrated at the pace that he's moving. He's not moving quick enough for what I want. and We're annoyed at the way he's treating us. But really we sin because we stop believing in the goodness of God, that our God is good. You see, at the heart, sin is not a habit issue. It's not a decision issue. It's a heart issue. Sin is not about behavior modification and changing the way we live. It's about a desire modification. We need to change our desires and seeing the goodness of God in everything and everyone. We need to draw this out in our world. But if it's about desires, not behaviors, what hope do we have? See, we need a new heart. As a church, we need a new heart. The only way is that God works in our heart to change it, to change our desires. And then as a community, as people have changed hearts, we live together, modeling this to each other, spurring one another on to live in a way that supports and draws out what God's doing in our lives and sharing that together, spurring one another on to good works. See, there's always hope for anyone who wants to come back to God because he will give you a new heart, change the desires. And we read this in Ezekiel as well. Amidst all the sin, all the judgment, all the calamity, there's seeds of hope. And in Ezekiel 11, it says, I will gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where you've been scattered, where you've been pushed away. I'll draw you together and I'll give you the land of Israel. 
This isn't everyone. He's bringing his people back. And when they come, when they gather together, when they come back to me, they will remove all the detestable things and their abominations. They will remove those from their midst. And in doing so, I will give them a new heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove their heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes, keep my rules and obey them. And they shall be my people and I'll be their God. My people who gather to worship me, to model me and to live my way. People who live under my rule and reign and ways. See, this is Ezekiel's warning for us today. As the people who, like Israel, live under God's rule, live under God's reign and his way, to be his people, to be his representatives, to be his light to the nations, as that's who we are, his warning is to examine ourselves, to look at the fruit that is in our lives, to see if there's any sin and to take it seriously, to look to see where is their pride, where is their gossip, where is their contempt? Where are the things that I try to bury away and then to run back to him, to give it to him so he can give us a new heart, to take it seriously and to live seriously as his people? And why does it matter? Why does this matter? Why does God take it so seriously? I think firstly because as his people we want to glorify him. But secondly... It's because the world is watching. We're called to be a light to the nations. We're called to be different and set apart, to be showing these characteristics of who God is in our midst and radiating out from our midst to those around us. Let me tell you why you are here. You are here to be a salt seasoning that brings out God's flavours of this earth. But if you lose your saltiness, how will the people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You are here to be light, to bring out God colours in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. And if I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that you've been put on the hilltop on a light stand, shine. Keep an open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to be open with God, the generous Father in heaven. We need to take sin seriously because we're called to be a people to bring out godliness and to radiate God's colors in the world. But the choice is, will I follow my desires, my heart, and push God away? Or will I radiate God out in our midst and to the world that needs to see him? to a world that needs to see hope. As we read through, as you read through Ezekiel, you'll see judgments, you'll see warnings, you'll see all these passages. And the reason they're there is because God has called us to be a people who are greater, a people who represent who he is to our world. We do hurt at times, but he's called us to be a community to hold each other, to build each other, to restore each other, and to represent him in our midst. And reveal him to a world who needs to see him. So imagine what it will look like if we take sin sin seriously. If we take this seriously and reveal God seriously. Imagine what it would look like if in our suburbs around us, people looked at us and they said, Cronials is different because they're showing God's colours. They're adding a seasoning and a flavour that's bringing out God in our midst. And there's something attractive about that. There's something different about that. And I need to know more. When we open ourselves up and be generous, people will be opened up to God. And that's why God takes sin seriously. And his invitation for us is to heed the warning, look at our lives and go, what what do I need to see changed? And to bring that to him. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you that you don't leave us in a place of despair. That in your warnings, in everything that you share, 
and the warnings towards us as people who want to live for you, that you don't look at us and remember our sins and hold a record of them, but you invite us to give those back to you so you can remove them so we can be a people who live for you and reveal you, who show your colours to the world around us, who puts you on display. I thank you that you're a God that doesn't give up, but a God that wants to see transformation, who takes sin seriously, more serious than we do, because you see the impact and the obstacle and the block it brings in our lives as we push you away and for our world as we hide you from them. I pray that we'll take it seriously so we can take you seriously and so our world can see you. May you continue to build us up as a people here together that love one another, that draw out uh, your character in our midst, that are quick to forgive, quick to show grace, quick to serve one another not to elevate ourselves, but to work out how we can love one another here and in our communities amongst us. I thank you that you don't leave us in this place of despair, but you've got that seed of hope of a new heart, a new way, a new life. I pray that you can draw that out in us and through us and amongst us. In Jesus' name, amen.